The quote to the effect, history is always written by the winners, was about well before Churchill at war, Goering, anyone in the British Commonwealth, like us Kiwis, would have been raised on the wins and not the losses. Military disasters like Gallipoli became a gallant propaganda victories for the good guys. In war comics like Commando, the Germans or Japanese never won a single engagement. I am sure you are familiar with the daring Armion prison raid by the iconic de Havilland mosquitoes from number 487 squadron RNZAF, February 1944, allowing French resistance prisoners to scarper through the rubble, more importantly, keep D-Day a secret. Another audacious raid, also involving mosquitoes from 487, the attack on Gestapo headquarters at our house, Denmark, October 44. One you'll know about as well, another win for the good guys, so to speak. Across those two famous raids, and just four dead and four who would become POWs, incredibly low casualty rates given the dangerous raids undertaken. Even 80 years later, the raids that weren't successful are mostly bypassed. Seemingly, we only want to watch the match when our team wins. This takes us back a couple of months before 487 RNZAF got their mosquitoes when they were undertaking raids in these twin-engined medium bombers, Lockheed Venturas, nicknamed pigs due to their size. Venturas were better suited for the war in the Pacific and going after U-boats. Beggars, well, they can't be choosers and the air battle over Europe by that stage was becoming a war of attrition, industrial capabilities. The planes weren't the weak link in the forecoming Big L. That was down to a combination of bad luck and bad timing. Although clearly, Venturas went a patch on the Mosquito when tasked with daytime hit and runs. 300 kilometres per hour loaded. The reason the chap in this photo was imitating kicking them to touch was a stark memory of the ill-fated raid over Amsterdam three months earlier. Ramrod 16 had had a devastating effect on the squadron, almost wiping it out. Twelve Venturas departed, two returned, one from the engagement, one had a mechanical shortly after takeoff. Out of the 48 crew, four per aircraft, 28 would die, numerous would be injured, and 12 would become prisoners. This is the story of that day, the fate of their aircraft and the crews, who were, by the way, a mixture of Kiwis, English and Canadians. And this wasn't the first raid on occupied Netherlands by 487. They'd already, say, attacked the Philips factory in Eindhoven in December 42, losing 3 from 13. The target of this raid was a power station, Nord, in close proximity to the shipyard to the left and to the right. Well, that was the Fokker factory. All wasn't lost, therefore, if your bombs drifted either side, missed the actual target. Then there was also the morale factor for the locals living under the jackboot. Ramrod 16 was also scheduled to go at the same time as a larger raid would be in some part a diversionary stretching German fighter forces, which sounded all good in theory. Even on a good day, with so many juicy targets within spitting distance, you can bet your jackboots, this particular neck of the woods, was well protected. The major airport airbase at Sheerpol being a mere hop, skip and a jump. The port area was bristling with anti-aircraft guns. To the success of the raid was the element of surprise. The 12 aircraft would leave Methwalk base in the UK at 16.45, fly 300 kilometres, literally in a straight easterly direction, meet up with two squadrons of escorting Spitfires shortly thereafter taking off. 35 Mark 5s would fly in close support, 24 Mark 9s would fly overhead. 
the Armada would cruise in unison just 100 feet above the waves of the North Sea to avoid radar detection, then climb suddenly to 10,000 feet before crossing the city from the coast to the port target. Total transit time for the bombers loaded, 70 minutes. Unloaded, scooting back home, just 45 the major reason Venturas were so successful in the Pacific sphere was their top speed, minus bombs, were on par with the Japanese Zero, not though a German ME-109, certainly not a Focke Wolf FW-190. Still, the 12 bombers had Spitfires for protection. Issue 1, spilling their doom, occurred within 30 minutes and they weren't the issues that led one aircraft being forced home early in the piece. One squadron of the escorts had gotten out of kilter and got ahead of the bunch and turning up on German radar, and thus any sort of secrecy they had planned prior to arriving on the Dutch coast was lost. This allowed the Germans to alert other fire bases in the proximity. Then to further increase the odds of a successful raid in a awful coincidence, the Luftwaffe was holding a conference in the city of Amsterdam, had assembled some of their best, most experienced fighter pilots who had been spending time in front of blackboards, working out how they were going to counter Allied bombers and formations, like the one approaching. The Germans had learnt the hard way. ME-109s were now vastly an inferior aircraft to the updated Spitfires. The only aircraft they could effectively compete head-to-head -head with were the Focke Wolfs. A mixture of 70 ME-109s and FW-190s were soon barreling towards the raiders. The FW-109s would keep the Spitfires busy. Not that they would have to dogfight entirely the two squadrons. They had arrived piecemeal over the city ahead of the bombers. These short-range fighters, the Spitfires, were limited in terms of their ability to undertake sustained dogfighting at max speed. Operating over home territory, the Luftwaffe had no such range issues. So virtually the entire force of ME-109s was brought to bear on the 12 bombers. Then once the Spitfires were forced home to refuel, the FW-109s joined in for good measure. In one word, overwhelmed. Two words, shit show. The first Venturas fell victim to the ME-109s even before they had reached the coast. The crew of AE-916 were the lucky ones. They managed to limp home and crash land. In the Maelstrom, a shot down a Focke Wolf for good measure. Two more planes to never make the Dutch coast, AE-956 and AE-978. They were shot down and crashed at sea. All eight crew would die, including the pilot on your screen. Two bodies were washed ashore, Sergeant Toombs of Christchurch and Englishman Flying Officer L.E. Richbell. Both now rest in Germany. This plane was all but shot in two. In the process of the attack, their gunner was killed. The pilot on your screen bailed out. However, sadly, his parachute was hit by a German gunfire of some kind. The two remaining crew smashed into the turf in what was left of the Ventura, miraculously surviving with just minor injuries. Another one to be literally shot out of the sky, just one survivor. The pilot, John Sharp from Wellington. One of the other crew members did get to bail out, a Sergeant Stevens. His parachute, though, it failed to envelop fully. The Dutch town, where parts of the plane crashed, has magnanimously immortalised the names of all four crew members on board AJ-200, naming streets after them. The cockpit of AE-731 was shot to ribbons, rendering it inoperable. The pilot, Terrace Taylor from Whangarei, 
told the other three crew to bail, and thinking he was now alone, his parachute being inoperative, Taylor Billy landed the aircraft. He then found out on landing, or crash landing, he was not alone. Three of the four survived, like the other survivors, spent the rest of the war behind German barbed wire. Now down to five, not having still crossed the city of Amsterdam, and under constant Luftwaffe fighter attack, in an underplayed act of valour from the day, the pilot of AE-780, Stuart McGowan, strapped a parachute on the wounded gunner, Ivan Ehrlich, from Taranaki, jettisoning him to safety as the aircraft began to cascade downwards, crashing smack into the middle of suburbia, killing not just the three remaining crew, seven civilians on the ground as well. Whilst we can't be 100% sure, the crashing events overhead are likely to have been the ones recorded in Anne Frank's diary on or about that date. Next to meet their fate, the entire crew of AE-713, including pilot Stanley Perryman from Christchurch, suffered a catastrophic explosion mid-air. The remains of their aircraft were scattered over a wide area below. They were still finding bits and pieces of the plane as late as 2019. Shortly after, all four of 716's crew went down with the ship to coin a euphemistic phrase. Pilot Thomas Banton is on your screen. He was 28 years old and left a wife in Dunedin. A damaged AJ-478 abandoned the raid, made a run for it, heading back out to sea, but there was no escape. The plane was downed over the ocean. Three of the four crew made it into an inflatable and were rescued by a German e-boat. The only one to die was Tim Warner of Machuaca, second on the right. That photo was taken the day before he died. The last remaining, AJ-209, the most famous aircraft of that raid, was the only one to make it within the broad vicinity of the target and drop its load in that vicinity. And during the bombing run, squadron leader Leonard Trent and crew managed to shoot down an ME-109 with their front guns. That's the scene depicted in the painting, before then becoming a victim of anti-aircraft fire. The plane went into a tailspin and broke up. Parachute saved the skins of Trent and his navigator, Thomas. The other two remained with the wreckage. The raid was now over. Not the war for some. The reason why AJ-209 is the most quoted aircraft in the raid is largely not because it was the only one to make it. The profile of the aircraft's pilot Leonard Trent was the last man to escape the tunnel in the famous and infamous Great Escape POW camp breakout. His immediate capture may well have ensured he wasn't shot by the Gestapo. And thus, he was alive to receive his Victoria Cross. went one better than the only other New Zealand Air Force pilot to receive a VC in World War II, Lloyd Trigg. His was posthumous. Link to that at the end and in the description of the video. Going on from the theme of RNZAF exploits in World War II, more in this genre of videos I've done was a Kiwi pilot that killed the only German field marshal to die in action in World War II. Lastly, before I get to the summary, that Spitfire pilot depicted at the beginning of the movie, Dunkirk, he was a Kiwi. His name was Alan Deere, another eye-bulging and brave boy's own story in the description. This is my summary, and part opinion I guess, one I have with the benefit of 2020 hindsight and in the safety of my peacetime study. 
everyone watching this video can but admire the valour displayed by all the aircrew. There is though a nagging question. The moment it was apparent the force they were facing was overwhelming. RAF fighter cover was proving totally ineffective. They were doomed well before they even reached the Dutch coast. Should they not have dropped their bombs into the drinks and hightailed it, lived to fight another day, the raid itself achieved nothing except ripping the guts out of the squadron, trench bombs having missed their prime target. I am sure there will be viewers out there up with the play on Ramrod 16, also called Ramrod 17, and can improve my narrative. By all means let us know what you think, add to the story in the comments. I get a real kick in particular hearing from relatives of those involved. Do give those other videos, I've slaved over a spin as well. Thanks to those that support my amateur hobby channel. I think my videos are worthy of being shared. Bye for now.